Hi, I'm Melanie Bertram. I'm a health economist at the World Health Organization and one of the authors of this series um, on the WHO Choice update. So WHO is choosing interventions that are cost effective or WHO Choice has been active for more than 20 years. The aim of WHO Choice has always been to support priority setting processes and to support the use of cost effectiveness data that has a consistent methodology across all decision making processes within health. This new series reports updated results based on a number of methodological changes. Firstly, we've integrated all the impact models into the Spectrum platform, which allows us to link the WHO choice analyses with the One Health tool for costing and strategic planning. We've updated all the baseline costing data and epidemiological data to much more recent estimates, and the intervention impacts and costs are now estimated over the lifetime rather than for only 10 years, which was the case in previous work. Results are presented with 3% discounting on costs and both 0% and 3% for health benefits in line with latest literature. I'm going to hand over to Karen Stenberg, a health economist at the World Health Organization and the lead author of the first results paper. Thank you, Melanie. The first results paper of the series presents an update on interventions to improve maternal, newborn, and child health. Today, still, we see that women and children's limited access to health services means that maternal and child health remains a major cause of the burden of disease in many low and middle income countries. In this paper, we show that the majority of the WHO recommended services for improving maternal, newborn, and child health are highly cost-effective, with average cost-effectiveness ratios under $100 per healthy life year gained. Still, many of these interventions are not included in current national health benefit packages, or they have limited uptake among the population because of supply-side constraints or low demand. This is a time of opportunity for us to further gear investments towards the high impact interventions and packages. These include high value interventions such as management of newborn infections and providing contraceptives for family planning. I'm now going to hand over to Ninsoa Velaidovi, a health economist at WHO. Over to you, Ninsoa. Thank you, Karen. Uh, the second results paper brings together HIV, TB, and malaria. Most intervention again fall below a cost-effectiveness ratio of $100 per healthy life year gained. Over the last decade, progress on HIV, TB, and malaria has been efficient. With the current mix of intervention at the regional level, sitting close to the efficiency frontier as defined by the expansion path. This finding is somewhat unique in global health where often the existing mix of intervention implemented in any setting does not represent the most cost-effective package. This should not lead to complacency, however. Intervention scale up and intensity of existing intervention must continue in order to ensure control of these epidemics. Back at you, uh, Melanie. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Ninsoa. So the final results paper brings together a set of non-communicable disease and mental health interventions, including prevention and promotion, as well as management options. The analysis presented in this final paper underpins the current Appendix 3 of the Global Action Plan for Non-Communicable Diseases, otherwise known as WHO's best buys for NCDs. Prevention and promotion interventions, such as tobacco tax and sodium reduction, remain the most cost-effective interventions, and for many NCD and mental health disorders, we still do not have interventions that fall into the highly cost-effective category represented by less than $100 per healthy life year gained. More needs to be done to reduce the costs of delivering interventions, particularly if the sustainable development goal to reduce premature mortality due to NCDs is to be achieved. The final paper in the series brings all this work together to show how a cost-effective package could be developed using just a value for money lens. Of course, universal health coverage benefit packages are selected based on multiple criteria and the selection process is a deliberative process. So these are stylized examples only. They're not intended to be packages that any country picks up and implements. 
From a value for money perspective, it is possible to develop a package which includes interventions from all of the disease areas covered by WHO choice and represents an efficient use of resources. To support countries to achieve universal health coverage, we must continue to expand the knowledge base of interventions and their cost effectiveness estimates in order to support decision makers in their progressive realization processes.